bombers of World War II were a revolution in warfare, hitting the enemy deep behind the lines. Both politicians and generals were fascinated by the new weapon. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Bombing brought about the first total war in history. Everyone was involved. Everyone a target. No one anywhere is safe from the bombs. But can bombing really win the war? Guernica, in the Spanish Basque country. Inspiration for Picasso's most famous painting the symbol of the total destruction by bombing of a peaceful town. For Guernica is a target for the most modern bomber fleet of the 1930s. The new German Luftwaffe. Adolf Hitler has sent his bombers to help Franco's fascists in the Spanish Civil War. The Condor Legion arrives in summer 1936. Reconnaissance photographer Alphonse Kersinger is given a special mission. I just know there was a road bridge north of Guernica, over the river Duerco, I think, and a railway bridge, and they had to be destroyed. And it was my job to photograph them in advance. Propaganda films show the Germans making every effort to plan an accurate attack using the latest technology. For Guernica, the reality is very different. On the 26th of April, 1937, the bombers of the Condor Legion are armed for the mission. 31 tons of high explosives and incendiaries. But the planes have very primitive bomb sites. Vittoriano Uruburu is watching from his home in the hills above the town. There was a fat aeroplane with a pipe sticking out of it. We couldn't take our eyes off it. We'd never seen anything like it. And then suddenly it dropped its bombs and there was an enormous noise and rubble was thrown everywhere. And then I thought of my mother. Where is she? And I ran down to Guernica to find her. Smoke from the first explosions covers the town. The second wave dropped their bombs indiscriminately over Guernica. When I reached the town, women and children came running towards me, shouting, Help! Help! The policemen were gathering them together and pushing them towards the cellars. Then I saw my mother in the middle of the crowd. I yelled to her, Mother, don't go down into the cellars, you'll be crushed. I grabbed hold of her and we ran up the hill together to our home. And that's how we escaped the inferno. After three hours of bombing, more than three quarters of the town is destroyed. 1,600 civilians are dead or wounded. The bridge is still standing. Two 
days later, Alphonse Kersinger takes his camera to Guernica to record the first destruction of a town by aerial bombing. Faced with such devastation, Basque resistance in the town crumbled. Whether it was intended or not, the destruction of Guernica showed that a strategy of terror bombing can work. When word of the results reaches Luftwaffe headquarters in Berlin, the mission is judged a complete success. The first bomb had been dropped from the air more than 25 years earlier. The story started in 1911 in Italy's colonial war in Libya. Lieutenant Giulio Gavotti dropped four two-kilogram bombs by hand onto Turkish troops. The bombs, it was said, decisively weakened the enemy's fighting spirit. Three years later, at the start of World War I, bombs are still being dropped by hand. They're used for the first time in large numbers at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Soon, special bomb racks are attached beneath the wings. The first bombers have arrived. The fighter pilots are the Knights of the Air. Hermann Goering is one of the leading aces in Red Baron Manfred von Richthofen's flying circus. For these flyers, the dogfight, man against man, is the ideal form of air war. But the Germans have other plans, to devastate the enemy's cities and destroy the morale of the population. In June 1917, they launch bombers against London. Giant aircraft, the Gotas, are built especially for the purpose. German raids on Britain kill 1,400. Londoners get a sharp taste of the future of warfare. There are reports of panic in the streets. The island fortress has been breached. Meanwhile, Britain's experts have already been busy. In Oxford, engineer and government advisor Frederick William Lanchester takes to his slide rule. In 1916, he works out how to destroy a whole city with bombs. He invents, theoretically, the firestorm. The critical point is that at which the pre-extinguishing appliances of the community are beaten or overcome. Beyond that point, the damage is disproportionately great. The city may be destroyed in toto. Not everyone believes that destroying cities is the answer. Munitions Minister Winston Churchill insists that terror bombing can't defeat a great industrial power. Nevertheless, by mid-1918, the RAF has built its own fleet of heavy bombers. 700 are killed in raids on German cities. On the 9th of November 1918, brand new giant bombers are due to bomb Berlin. But the raid is postponed. Two days later, Germany signs the armistice. Berlin is spared. The Versailles Treaty forces the Germans to destroy their entire air force. 15,000 planes are handed over or ripped apart. But the Royal Air Force remains, and it needs a role. The new war minister, Winston Churchill, helps find one. Air policing. Britain has taken over large chunks of the defeated Turkish Empire. One of the men sent to control tribal uprisings is squadron leader Arthur Harris. 
Harris realizes that in the deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan, planes can do in hours what it would take troops weeks to do. Within 45 minutes, a full-sized village can be practically wiped out and a third of its inhabitants killed or injured by four or five machines. Harris's men become some of the top bombing pilots of the RAF. As early as 1908, writer H.G. Wells had imagined a bombing attack by the Germans on New York. By the time it is filmed in the 1930s, people are ready to believe in a full-scale bomb attack on their cities. In 1935, in Germany, the new National Socialist government tears up the Versailles Treaty. World War I fighter ace Hermann Goering, now Hitler's closest confidant, is given the task of building up an air force at top speed. Hitler wants as many planes as possible, as fast as possible. In 1935, Göring officially announces the existence of his Luftwaffe. Wieder schirmt den deutschen Luftraum eine opferbereite deutsche Luftwaffe. Nicht als Angriffswerkzeug ist sie geschaffen worden. Einzig und allein ist es ihre Aufgabe, unserem Volk den Frieden zu bewahren. Dafür wird sie sich einsetzen bis zum letzten Mann. But the Luftwaffe is designed for a war of conquest. It's just a matter of time. Alarmed by Germany's new Luftwaffe, the British build up a bomber force of their own. Goering's air force is designed to help the German army grab territory. The new British bombers have a different aim. Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in 1932. The bomber will always get through. The only defense is in offense which means that you have to kill more women and children more quickly than the enemy if you want to save yourselves. In cities like Coventry, new factories spring up, building both bombers and fighters. No one quite knows if defense against the bombers will be possible. New crews are trained with new theoretical tactics. But as yet, the RAF has nowhere to put the theory into practice. The government also tries to prepare the civilian population for war. It was from 38 to 39, I think people did start taking it seriously and um, wondering what they should do and various instructions. And they formed organizations like um, air raid wardens, you know, with a pathetic little stomach um, pump thing, you know, and a bucket of sand. Uh, I don't think they really realized what it could be. Uh, as, um, but yes, I think um, my father certainly felt because he, he said, I think it's going to be another war. People are advised to make their own arrangements for protection from the air raids, with mixed results. Meanwhile, the Luftwaffe is testing its newest bombs on concrete bunkers and fake apartment blocks at a test range near Berlin. Stuka bombardier Theodor Plotter witnesses the tests. The bombs had different kinds of detonators, impact detonators, and ones that went off deep underground to make a big crater. And there was the D-knot detonator. That exploded a meter above the ground to kill as many enemy soldiers as possible. Franco wins in Spain. 
and the triumphant Condor Legion returned to Germany, bringing with them the lessons of Guernica. Weeks later, on September the 1st, 1939, the Germans invade Poland. World War II has begun. 340 Stuka dive bombers lead a thousand planes into the attack. They smash a path for the German tanks to the Polish capital. Blitzkrieg. Stukas drop their bomb after a steep dive directly over the target. Blood wird aus dem Kopf runtergezogen und man meint, man hätte The blood drains from your head and you feel your face change shape. Your cheek muscles and everything else is dragged down. You'd hate to see yourself in the mirror. Some pilots even blacked out for a few seconds. That was how they screamed. First one plane dived and then another in an endless chain. All we could think of when we heard that sound was that the bombs were coming. When we heard it for the first time, I think it was the fourth day of the war, the day they first attacked Warsaw. It simply shattered the morale of the whole population. I was sheltering in a doorway. Suddenly, a young girl came out through the door. She was about 18 or 20. She was dressed very prettily in a cornflower blue coat and white gloves. I was young then, so I noticed her. But she ran off down the street. And when the bombs started to land further away, I left the doorway and tried to run to the next. And suddenly, I see a white glove. I look more closely, and there's a hand in it, torn off. It was the girl's hand. That's all I ever found of her. After three days of intensive bombing, Warsaw surrenders. Soldiers aren't supposed to think. They used to say to us, horses have bigger heads. Let them do the thinking. And we were just boys. I was 17, 17 and a half. And for us, the whole thing was an adventure. Almost 20,000 soldiers and civilians are killed in the siege of Warsaw. Diese Luftwaffe hat hier Leistungen vollbracht, die für immer unvergänglich sein werden. Die Luftwaffe hat hier in höchstem Maße mit dazu beigetragen, den Gegner zu schlagen und zu vernichten. Und was die Luftwaffe in Polen versprochen hat, wird diese Luftwaffe in England und Frankreich halten. Die Luftwaffe keeps its promise. In May 1940, it blazes a path for the army across France and the Low Countries. By the end of May, Goering's Stukas are dive-bombing British and French troops on the beaches of Dunkirk. But operating on their own against a desperate British fighter defense, the Stukas and light bombers are vulnerable. They can't prevent more than 300,000 soldiers returning to England. Adolf Hitler in Paris. Victorious in the East and in the West, he is close to ending the war he began less than a year before. In London, the government is desperate Britain is without allies. 
Winston Churchill has been prime minister for just three weeks. From his bunker beneath the cabinet office, Churchill can offer nothing but defiance. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on beaches, landing grounds, in fields, in streets, and on the hills. We shall never surrender. By contrast, Hitler wants a deal with Britain. But he puts it in rather unfriendly terms. Britain ignores Hitler's offer. Hitler decides on invasion. But first, Goering must win air superiority over England. On the 13th of August, he launches massive attacks against English fighter airfields and radar stations. RAF fighter pilots can barely wait to engage the enemy. The air raid warning in the local town was sounded quite by mistake. And so I didn't want to be caught on the ground, so I scrambled with my flight and, uh, and we took off. And we were very smartly told to come back and land again. <laughs> and uh, I got a rocket from my CO and from the station commander who is to, we'll tell you when to go. The command system is so effective that many opponents overestimate British resources. The English were the toughest opponents we had, no doubt about it. They were very good fighter pilots, and of course you have to add that the English had much, much greater reserves and much longer training than we did. The RAF's Spitfires and Hurricanes cause heavy losses to the Luftwaffe's fighters and bombers. And there we were, hanging over London like ripe plums, and the Spitfires would dive towards us from three or four thousand feet above us at 270 or 280 miles an hour. And that's when I realized for the first time that the Spitfires were better than us. The figures are clear. Day after day, the Luftwaffe is losing more men and machines than the RAF. Without air superiority, the invasion can't go ahead. But the Luftwaffe's attacks continue. On the 24th of August, a crucial event takes place that is unexplained to this day. Hitler had forbidden attacks on London. But that day, bombs fall on the city, probably dropped by bombers that have lost their way. Churchill immediately orders the first raid on Berlin. How I've been longing to say this. The RAF are back from bombing Berlin. The Wellington bombers hardly cause any damage to the German capital. But Hitler is furious. He orders Goering to launch continuous day and night attacks on British cities. And when the British Luftwaffe 200 or 4,000 kg bomben wirft, then we will now in one night 150, 180, 300. The Germans launch concerted raids against Britain's industrial cities. Coventry, the center of British aircraft production, 
but also a tightly packed medieval city. On the night of the 14th of November, 1940, the cathedral and city center are set on fire with incendiary bombs. High explosives block the streets, preventing the fire brigade from reaching the fires. Five hundred and sixty-eight people are killed. Gleefully, Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels invents a new word. In future, all British cities will be coventrated. But the main target is the capital. London is attacked 57 nights in succession until mid-December. The targets are supposed to be industrial and commercial like the Docklands, but it's impossible to avoid hitting civilians, especially in the darkness. find themselves the targets of the bombs. Increasingly, this looks like a war of terror and attrition. For the British, it is simply the Blitz. Huge fires are started, which the fire brigade cannot extinguish. London is dangerously close to being overwhelmed by a firestorm. The main place where they caused firestorms was in the centre of London, all, all around St Paul's, all around there. And I've been in a firestorm, and it, it's horrible. It is horrible. Because uh, you s these buildings are all going up. You're in the centre of it, then you realise it's getting hotter and hotter, and then a wind starts up. And that's the thing that causes the trouble, because... When it starts up, if you suck it down, it'll burn your lungs. Luckily, a full-scale firestorm never develops in London. More than 42,000 people die in the Blitz. 45,000 are injured and a million made homeless. But the idea that you can bomb a population into submission is proved spectacularly wrong. The people stand firm behind Churchill. Their morale is not broken. And every bomb makes the call for revenge louder. The cities of Great Britain salute their brothers in this hour of tribulation, but not defeat. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. June 1941, German dive bombers are on the attack again. This time the target is not Britain, but the Soviet Union. After losing 2,000 planes over Britain, Hitler's attention has switched to the more important campaign in the East. In spite of the failure of the Blitz, the Führer still supports Hermann Goering. The head of the Luftwaffe's confidence is not dented. Britain will simply have to wait. But Churchill has no intention of waiting. He sees only one way to hit back at the Germans. An absolutely devastating, exterminating attack by very heavy bombers from this country upon the Nazi homeland. At last, the heavy bombers are on their way. But Bomber Command's aerial attacks on Germany have so far been ineffectual. If the bombers even find their targets, they sometimes lose more aircrew than they kill people on the ground. High Wycombe in Buckinghamshire, headquarters of RAF Bomber Command. In February 1942, Air Marshal Arthur Harris takes over. The colonial policeman has become the RAF's bombing expert. 
he brings a new sense of purpose to the command. His influence on us was very, very strong. And we worshipped him uh, as being the right commander for us at the right time. Harris's task is to build the force for Churchill's devastating attack. His target, the German war machine. And if individual factories can't be hit, that means area bombing of industrial centers at night. But Harris has higher ambitions. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Germany, clinging more and more desperately to her widespread conquests and even seeking foolishly for more, will make a most interesting initial experiment. The official documents spell it out. The weakest point of German war machinery is the morale of the civil population, and in particular, of the industrial workers. And Air Force Chief of Staff Charles Portal adds, Aiming points are to be the built-up areas, not, for instance, the dockyards or aircraft factories. This must be made quite clear if it is not already understood. Harris has his green light. In Berlin, there is no sense of foreboding. This is a city at peace. An army exhibition turns the air war into child's play. And a public information film turns air raids into minor domestic incidents. First ineffective British raids are a tourist attraction. It was a sensation. Hundreds of people queued up to see what a bomb crater looked like. Old people remembered a bomb falling on the Rheinische Straße in 1917 in the First World War, and they all told their stories. It was a sensation. Hermann Göring had boasted that not a single bomb would fall on Germany. If it did, he would change his name. Well, a couple of weeks later, a bomb knocked down our neighbor's house. And he became Mr. Meyer. In his gigantic new air ministry, Hermann Göring, head of the Air Force, Imperial Marshal, and master of the Imperial Hunt, is beginning to lose contact with reality. He's still basking in his blitzkrieg victories over Poland and France. He's not worried about any threat from Britain. But his own officers are beginning to have their doubts about him. He came through the door in that familiar way, looking like a giant dumpling. And the thing I noticed was he was wearing makeup. He had bright red cheeks. And it was strange. Somehow his face looked unnatural. Goering revels in the role of the pilot prince. Technical and strategic details bore him. But he always has a handful of medals in his pocket when he visits the front line. East Anglia, the 30th of May, 1942. Arthur Harris's experiment is about to begin. He has scraped together bombers from training schools and coastal command to make up the magic figure of 1,000 leading the attack of the new Lancaster bombers with their six-ton bomb load. Codename Millennium. 
target, Cologne. The city has been chosen at the last minute because the weather is good. In spite of heavy anti-aircraft fire, 868 bombers find the city center. The bombs were released by pressing the button and that went through to a small motor and it set the firing arms um, of each bomb in, cons in routine. The bombs were dropped one, two, three, all the way through. It was more a technical thing than anything else. You didn't have time to weigh up the pros and cons of whether you were doing the right thing or not. It was a job, press the button, go. High explosives blast open the rooftops. Then countless tiny incendiary bombs fall among the rafters of the medieval town and start fires. Soon, they are infernos. By morning, the city center is laid waste. For the citizens of Cologne, this is terror bombing, on a scale no one in Germany could have anticipated. 480 are killed, and, as Bomber Command puts it, 45,000 are de-housed. A woman checks for relatives in the casualty lists. Harris's shock tactics seem to be working. This is really one of the best raids. It's really bang on the target. And I hope that soon we'll all get a chance to have a few more raids like that. I'm sure that will help to finish the war very much sooner. The Germans know they can expect more. Suddenly, they are on the defensive. And Harris's campaign is about to receive a huge boost. In summer 1942, the US Air Force joins the RAF with its first bombing raids against Germany. The US generals believe that B-17 is the best bomber in the world. The Flying Fortress can fly higher and further than any other bomber. It's heavily armored and bristling with defensive machine guns. And it can bomb more accurately than any aircraft in history. And there's no shortage of volunteers to fly them. I just felt in a couple of weeks I'd get a silk scarf and a leather jacket and I'd be like John Wayne and I'd be fighting uh... Uh, fighting the enemy, whoever it might be. Uh, and that's what I expected. But of course, it didn't turn out that way. <laughs> uh, training took over a year. The Americans are brimful of self-confidence. They too believe they can win the war by bombing. But their approach couldn't be more different. Whereas the British bomb at night, the Americans believe they can hit individual targets from 25,000 feet in daylight. Practicing against a portrait of Japanese Emperor Hirohito in the desert, the results are impressive. But in training, there's no wind or cloud, and no one is shooting at you. We learned to fly in daylight, and we learned to bomb in daylight. The British had told the Americans that, that it's impossible. We've tried it. Don't try it but this is the way we knew how to do it. So we said, we'll do it our way. We had a bomb site, and we thought we could use a bomb site, and you can't use a bomb site at night, and it doesn't work. You need it in the daytime, and we thought we could bomb it in the daytime. But the German air defenses are reorganized after the shock of Cologne. <laughs> By the beginning of 1943, the biggest flak army ever seen has been assembled. More than a million strong, many of them schoolboys. An officer came into the classroom in the middle of a lesson and told us that from the 15th of February, that was about two weeks away, all the boys born in 1926 or 27 would be called up as flak auxiliaries. You should have heard us. There was an ear-splitting roar of joy. Now we were part of it. Now we were soldiers. 
the Americans were soon to learn what flak could do. Well, what it looks like is puffs of smoke. I compare it to uh, the opening of an umbrella. You know, you see a little bit at a time and then it gets bigger. And of course, the flak you see is the flak that misses you. It's the flak you don't see that hits you. There was no protection up there. There was nothing, you know, we were just like geese going over a blind. Some of the geese get shot down, but most of them make it through, and you just hope you're one of the geese that get through. By the spring of 1943, US bomber pilots are facing serious losses. Flying fortresses are shot down in their hundreds. It simply reinforces Harris's view. Night attacks on cities are the key to success in the bombing war. His experiment enters its second phase. In March 1943, Harris unleashes the Battle of the Ruhr. This densely populated region is the center of Germany's coal and steel industry. It is exceptionally heavily defended. For three months, Harris sends his bombers out every night, weather permits. The bomber crews call the Ruhr the land of no return, and some give it another name. Happy Valley was the most dangerous area in the whole of Germany for uh, bombers because they had such heavy concentrations of uh, searchlights and uh, anti-aircraft. For civilians waiting below, the tension is permanent. Today, it's our turn. And I could hear the drone of the engines getting nearer, and I ran to the bunker. It was only 300 meters, but I was panicking, and when your legs start to give way, that seems an enormous distance. I stumbled, I, I fell down and I got up again. And by the time I got to the shelter, the first bombs were dropping. I dashed down, more flying than running. And then all hell broke loose. It was as if the world was about to end. And then something really awful happened. From the edge of town, you could already see the flak guns firing. And there was the noise. It kept going light, dark, light, dark, like lightning. And just before we got to the bunker, we realized, more me than my parents, that Clements was missing. He'd gone back to the flat. He'd gone back to bed. I told the bunker warden I'd knock twice long and once short so he'd know it was me, because otherwise he wouldn't open the door to protect the people inside. Valentin Frank runs from the bunker back to the flat and ties his brother onto his back with a bedsheet. Then I ran for my life. The bombs were getting closer and closer. The noise, the music of the bombers, that was frightening. And then I knocked hard and got into the bunker. You can imagine how heavy my brother was. He was three years younger than me, but I was only 14. And my brother wouldn't be here today if someone hadn't dragged him out of there. It's May 1943. The Battle of the Ruhr is at its peak as Dortmund is attacked. In the morning, there are 700 bodies in the streets. I was detailed to throw the bodies onto trucks in front of the station. The horrible thing was we had to swing the bodies up onto the truck so we could get enough in. Because if we just laid them one on top of the other, then they would have all stayed next to the tailgate and not enough would have fitted in.
At the Casablanca conference in January 1943, the Western Allies had confirmed their bombing strategy. Your primary object will be the progressive destruction of the German military, industrial and economic system and the undermining of the morale of the German people. And Churchill and Roosevelt take two more decisions at Casablanca. They delay the invasion for a full year, giving the bombers more time. And they demand Germany's unconditional surrender. It's a gift for Nazi propaganda minister Josef Goebbels, as he channels public fury against the bombers. Everyone, even children, can now be mobilized. In 1939, Hitler launched his Stukas in the Blitzkrieg on Poland. By 1943, the Allies are hitting back. The British and Americans plan to bomb Germany into submission. Spring 1943. For British bombers, the night sky over Germany is a terrifying place. German cities are ringed with lethal flak batteries. We got uh, caught in the searchlight, which is quite frightening. You can't see anything except just light. And uh, the captain throws the aircraft all over the sky to try and get out of it. In front of us, there was another bomber. It must have been about nearly half a mile ahead of us and suddenly a major searchlight came on and had him dead in the middle. And, uh, of course, then that alerted all the guns and it started to come up, all the anti-aircraft fire. And because he was on his bombing run in, he kept on straight and narrow and he just blew apart. One, he had a direct hit into the bomb bay and the whole lot went off. The starboard wing just blew into a blaze of petrol and the port came off the aircraft. The engines were still running and it went slowly round in a semicircle before it all blew up. And of course seven men died. Radar-guided German night fighters are an even bigger threat. Approaching bombers are detected by ground-based radar. Then the airborne radar has to find the bombers in the darkness. After that, it's easy pickings. German night fighters hunted in pairs. If they were going to attack you, one made himself fairly obvious um, high up on the port or starboard side, and you could see him. But his pal was underneath your aircraft. We could fly under a British bomber for hours without him even noticing there was someone there. He couldn't see us. And then we would drop back into the attack position and as soon as we had him in our sights, we pressed the firing button. He was usually on fire after the first burst. He had no chance. No chance at all. Heinz Rucker once shot down six bombers in a single night. By day, the battle is more equal. Germany's Messerschmitt fighters are getting long in the tooth. But they're still a match for the American intruders. They can't stop the bombers reaching Germany. But when they intercept, 
combat is brutal. As you dive down from high altitude onto a bomber formation stretched out below, they look like a string of pearls. Beautiful, wonderful sight, peaceful. But a few seconds later, it was very different. It was a terrible strain on the nerves. I don't know if the others closed to 400 meters before pressing the button. I couldn't. I admit it. I couldn't. I usually started firing at 600 meters, just to calm my nerves. But it's very difficult to hit. We're lumbering along at 150 miles an hour, and they're moving at 400 miles an hour, and a lot maneuverable you only see they, it seems like they're there for a long time but actually the, the, uh, from the time you see them until they're past maybe only two or three seconds so. man konnte beobachten dass uh, you would watch a few rounds from a 20 millimeter cannon ripping apart the wing of a four-engine bomber or even tearing it right off. The effect was incredible, again and again. It was, perhaps this is the wrong thing to say, but it was a treat for the eyes to see the effect of those cannon shells. Hundreds of US airmen bail out over Germany. <laughs> we had an escape kit that we kept in a zippered compartment in our fatigue suit. The escape kit consisted of um, some powdered coffee, some fish hooks, some thread with the buttons some German Deutschmarks, a couple of condoms, um, and a phrase book. There was a little, little things like, wo is das Kino? Wo is das Zugbahn? And I thought, this is a little peculiar. I don't believe if that if I had a parachute over Germany, I would get hold of some German citizen and say, wo is das Kino? More than 60 Allied airmen who fall into the hands of civilians are lynched, especially if they land near the town they've been bombing. By 1943, emergency programs have built 2,000 new bunkers in the cities. Still not enough for the whole population. The rest make do with cellars or improvised tunnels. In the shelters, morale holds out surprisingly well. Life underground becomes a habit. You have a numbered seat, or even a bunk. A new kind of normality. I never really got undressed. I wore a tracksuit in bed, so I was already dressed when the siren sounded. And I had my air raid bag packed, a little rucksack, and a blanket and gym bag with a bottle of water and something to eat, because we seemed to sit forever in those tunnels. The bombs fall night and day. First the British, then the Americans. But the collapse in German morale just doesn't come. Civilians can't do anything about the war, so they just carry on. <laughs> Writing your new address on the ruins of your home is the only way to stay in touch. And the regime makes sure bomb victims are well cared for. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
And my aunt said, go to the Hotel Atlantic. My aunt said, go to the Hotel Atlantic. They're doling out food there, and you can get us some. So I ran up to the windows, and at the first one it was bread. And he asked, how many of you are there? And I said, four. Actually, there were only three of us, my aunts and me. So he gave me a whole loaf. I hadn't seen anything like that for weeks. I went to the next window. How many? Four. You better take the whole crate. That was smoked fish, and there were churns of milk. You couldn't get that anymore. And real coffee. Beans. In spite of the bombs, the distribution of food is very well organized by the government. Civilian discipline is maintained. At British bomber bases, the war of attrition is taking a terrible toll. And it's clear the German war machine is not collapsing. The pressure on Harris is overwhelming. He needs a knockout blow. He has already chosen his target. Hamburg is Germany's second largest city and easily reachable from England. But Harris's biggest problem is that German radar will make his bombers easy pickings. The RAF's boffins come to his aid. If they can discover the wavelength used by the Germans, they've dreamt up a way of rendering radar ineffective. The secret weapon? Simple strips of tinfoil dropped from the skies. In the end, the secret of the radar frequency is delivered into their laps. Two Luftwaffe traitors seal the fate of the city of Hamburg. On the 9th of May, 1943, a Junkers 88 night fighter with the latest Liechtenstein radar takes off in Norway. Over the North Sea, it sends a distress signal. It is listed as missing, cause unknown. The two pilots, Herbert Schmidt and Paul Rosenberger, are anti-Nazis. Holding a gun to the head of their third crew member, they fly onto Scotland and deliver the radar. Their plane is still on display in London. Now the scientists can cut the aluminium strips to the right size, and the RAF can launch the biggest air raid the world has ever seen. Those strips of foil reflected all the radar rays, and instead of single notches on the tiny screen, you saw hundreds. It all became smudged, so you couldn't fire the flak with any kind of accuracy. We certainly fired at planes that were phantoms, but weren't even there. The 24th of July, 1943, is a hot summer day in Hamburg. The start of Operation Gomorra, planned to last 10 days and nights. The bombers take off in the early evening. Shortly after midnight, they reach Hamburg. At 33 minutes past 12, the sirens sound. Night fighters and flak crews go on alert. But the radar screens have gone haywire, and millions of strips of tinsel are falling from the skies. An 80-mile stream of bombers flies over Hamburg, almost unhindered. On the third night, the 26th of July, the fires join up into a firestorm on a scale never seen before. On the streets, temperatures reach 1,000 degrees centigrade. Hurricane-force winds suck civilians into the flames. It's the perfect raid.
Even the bomber crews feel the force of the fires. The glow fills their cockpit at 20,000 feet. It was horrific. It's just a sea of fire and cloud. But as you got further and further away from the target on the way home, uh, then you could see it, see it in all its uh, enormity. And it was very frightening to think of what was happening down below and what we had done. For 10 days, British and American bombers returned to the city. The fire brigades can do nothing to stop the fires. There was a body with its face stuck into a grating. He was trying to get one more mouthful, half a lungful of oxygen. He suffocated in broad daylight, I mean in the middle of the night, through lack of oxygen, lying there, dead. There was nothing we could do. Forty thousand people die in Hamburg, a hundred times as many as in the thousand bomber raid on Cologne just a year before, as many as died in the entire Blitz on Britain. For many sheltering in the cellars, death came through suffocation and incineration. When I got back, combined with seeing it, the newspaper reports of it were pretty horrendous. There was a story. I don't know how the devil they got it, but it was a story of a mother with a little girl. And the fires were so intense that the tar on the roads were melting. And the mother tried to get across the road with her little girl. The little girl fell, fell over, landed flat on her face. And the mother died trying to get her out of the tar. And I've never, I've never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it. The man's inhumanity to man, it, that just about sums it up, I reckon. And it makes me feel guilty. I'm the man who pressed the button. We had a stairwell at home and a spiral stone staircase going up. Hanging in the middle was a lamp in a glass globe. And it was intact. I picked up a stone and smashed it because I thought if everything else is ruined, then that should be too. A million people flee Hamburg. Whole streets are sealed off as a precaution against epidemics. Public life in Germany's second biggest city breaks down completely. In Berlin, the regime is badly shaken. Propaganda minister Josef Goebbels writes in his diary of a catastrophe on an unimaginable scale. He fears a total collapse of civilian morale. Hitler and Goering have no answers, no message for the people of Hamburg. They plan extravagant revenge with bomber forces that no longer exist. For Harris, it is a triumph. In November, he writes to Churchill. We can wreck Berlin from end to end if the US Air Force will come in on it. It will cost between us 400 to 500 aircraft. It will cost Germany the war. Days later, Harris launches the Battle of Berlin. The Hamburg firestorm was the greatest success yet for Harris's bomber command. Now he plans to destroy Berlin and thereby win the war. In November 1943, 
the RAF begins a series of murderous raids on the German capital. By the end of the war, they will total more than 300. We actually bombed Berlin 13 times, the, uh, uh, the force, uh, and we did 11 of them. It became a way of life. That was it. I mean, you went, you came back, you slept, you went again, and so on. It was, uh, that, that, that's all you thought about, and that's all you did. But Berlin isn't the ideal target that Hamburg was. It has more open spaces, and it just doesn't burn as well. The morning after a raid on Berlin, as seen in a propaganda newsreel, a hearty breakfast in the ruins. In fact, people do carry on as best they can. They adapt. Life goes on as normally as possible. For children, the ruins become an adventure playground. Wir haben we collected flak splinters. After an attack, bits of flak fell to the ground, and we collected them off the street. I remember I had a cigar box of my father's. I kept my splinter collection in that, and we used to compare our collections and see who had the most and who had the biggest. People are collecting bomb splinters all over Germany even in the countryside. Just as in the London Blitz three years before, the bombing brings people closer together. The collapse of morale that even the Nazis feared never happens. Propaganda minister Josef Goebbels makes sure Berliners, now mainly women, are fed a regular diet of concerts, films and shows. Stars like Ilse Werner are there to keep morale high. It was quite something in the war. The people really did stick together. After all, we were all in the same boat. It was hard for all of us. Audiences can escape reality for a little while, but then life has to go on. Performances are regularly interrupted by the air raids, but there's always a shelter nearby. When I came into the bunker, I saw women sitting there with woolen cloths on their heads. I asked my mother why, and she said it was in case a bomb fell, to protect their heads from falling debris. The inspiration for this turban I'm wearing today came when I saw all the women sitting there in the shelters with their head cloths. I thought, Maybe you could do that as a hat. So I mentioned it to a designer in Berlin, and she said, let's have a go. We've got these turbans, and I can make you one. See what you think. And because of me, they became all the rage. The Battle of Berlin is the biggest air assault in history. For the RAF, it's a disaster. Bomber Command loses more than 800 planes and 3,000 airmen. And Berlin is not destroyed. American Air Force generals keep out of the Battle of Berlin. They prefer to stick to their strategy of precision bombing. Some of the missions are especially ambitious. When the briefing was just about over, the commanding officer, Colonel Keyes, handed me an envelope. He looked right at us and he said, you will open those only after you have gotten out over the Adriatic Sea. The main note said, 
you are to turn off at the IP when they go to turn to to, uh, to uh, Munich. You turn right to Birch's Garden. We didn't know why. They never told us why in that note. You will bomb the parking lot in front of Birch's Garden. Everything goes according to plan. Porter's squadron crosses the Alps from Italy. At Berchtesgaden, Garden, he drops his bombs. Then he returns for debriefing. In comes Colonel Keyes. Well, he said, you guys done a whale of a job, but he said, you missed the target. We said, no, it's right here. No, he said, the target wasn't that parking lot. The target was Hitler. Now we said, what? He said, yeah, Hitler was supposed to be in that parking lot. So that was the latest information we had. He had a flat tire just three minutes before he got there. No one knows if Hitler was really there, but special missions like this are unlikely to win the war. Hitler now spends most of his time in one of his many bunkers. His offices in the Imperial Chancellery in Berlin have long been empty. Spring 1944. The war enters a decisive new phase, the preparations for D-Day in Normandy. Intensive bombing raids clear the way for the invading armies. Suddenly, the bomber is a tactical weapon. The race to Germany has begun by armies on land. Allied air superiority over northern France is absolute. Before D-Day, American aircraft pounded the German aircraft factories. Now they and the RAF start a great offensive against the oil industry, the Achilles heel of the German war machine. The oil fields at Ploesti in Romania are heavily defended. My goodness, there's refineries all over the place down there and we would be given a certain refinery to, to drop our bombs on, and our bombardier would zero in on that. And so uh, we were on Ploesti, the third mission. Well, that's when we found out what combat really was. We were attacked by ME-109s and ME, or I mean FW-190s real hard before we got to the flag. The raids are a great success. German oil production falls to danger levels. Yet within weeks, the refineries can be partly repaired. The Germans fight on. But an official American study after the war argues that if decisive targets had been hit, the oil offensive could have paid greater dividends. The report singles out two factories, Garpel and Froser. At these plants, the Germans manufacture tetraethyl, a petrol additive essential to high-performance engines. They are vulnerable to attack and barely defended. Destroying these plants would have been disastrous to the Germans. They should have had a top priority at bombing. It's a debate that continues to this day. Were targets missed that could have knocked Germany out of the war? The oil loading port at Emden on the North Sea coast is attacked several times. Pilots are ordered to make every bomb count, if necessary, on targets of opportunity. Near Emden is a small town called Azens. The war hasn't reached the 3,000 inhabitants of this quiet backwater. It has no military significance. the 27th of September, 1943. An American bomber squadron crosses the North Sea coast. Their target, Emden, is covered in cloud. Two flights of bombers can't find the town. They fly on. In Azens, the primary school overlooks the church square. 
da sah ich die Flieger I saw the planes. I only saw six or seven. They say there were 18, but they were big and flying so low they made a tremendous row. It was awful. They seemed to be moving so slowly. It was very threatening. The children shelter in the basement of the school. It receives a direct hit. I came to and thought, what's happening? I was stuck amongst the rubble. I was completely covered. I just had one hand, my left hand sticking up, and I was standing upright in the rubble. Then I heard children screaming, very loudly, and I thought, it's coming from under the rubble. And I started to dig, but it was hopeless. Ewald Donker was one of the few pulled out alive. And I can remember, I saw a classmate lying in front of me. His name was Hayo Geras. His shin bone was sticking out. And seeing that as a child is horrible. And to my left was a girl, and she was dead. I'll never forget what she looked like. There was no color in her face, and her lips were gray. 85 children die in the basement of the school. Esens, I mean, is a dairy a vital target? Esens had a dairy. That's all I know. A dairy. Was es da war? Eine Molkerei. The dairy was not the target of the American bombers. The mission report confirms that the target was the port of Emden. But two flights saw Azens through a gap in the clouds. A target of opportunity. American aerial photographs show that none of the bombs missed the village. Beginning of 1944, the US Air Force introduced thousands of long-distance escort fighters. Within weeks, the Allies have won total air superiority over Germany. Between Darmstadt and the Swiss border, we had about 50 planes. And I've seen a report saying that against us there were 50,000. All I could tell my boys was to recce fast, to attack fast, and above all, to get out as fast as possible. Most German fighters are out of date. The new pilots hopelessly inexperienced. More and more planes are destroyed on the ground. Even the veterans begin to give up. One of our flight sergeants, Müller was his name. We never did find out what happened to him. He was tidying his locker one morning and he arranged everything perfectly and his roommate said, what are you being so fussy about today? And he said, well, you never know what might happen. Somehow he knew he wasn't coming back and he didn't. The head of the Luftwaffe, Hermann Göring. He's rarely seen these days. But as casualty lists lengthen, he gathers his men together to give them a dressing down. He told the whole lot of them that German fighter pilots had turned into cowards. They weren't shooting down planes anymore because they weren't brave enough and they didn't attack. Goering demands total commitment, to the point of kamikaze attacks. Hermann Goering, so, um, Hermann Goering, father figure, right? Goes up to a young fighter pilot, claps him on the shoulder and says, you're chasing a bomber, you want to shoot him down, but you're out of ammunition. So what do you do? 
und willst den abschießen, hast du denn deine ganze Munition verschossen. I ram him, Reichsmarschall. Dann ramm ich ihn, Herr Reichsmarschall. Good lad, good lad. Absolutely right. So ist es richtig. Fighter Pilot Willi Reschke takes Göring's advice. In der Zwischenzeit war ich an der Fehmotorin dran. I was behind a four-engine bomber and I decided to use my speed advantage to maybe take the right tail unit out. And I tried it first with my left propeller and then with my left wing. And it worked. And then came a crash and a tearing, splintering sound as the two planes slammed into each other. You don't forget that sound in a hurry. Rischke bails out. I noticed two Mustangs circling me. One of them banked round and came straight at me. And then I heard the rattle of its machine guns and I realized that its bullets must have already passed me. And the feeling I had then made my blood freeze. Afterwards I said, well, someone else can do the ramming next time. I'm not doing it again. And I never did. Hitler abandons Göring's Luftwaffe to its fate. He's obsessed with revenge against Churchill and London with the V-weapons. The V-1 and V-2, the world's first long-distance missiles. They have no guidance system. Their only purpose is to spread terror among the civilian population. Most are aimed at London. It's too big to miss. Gerhard Heilig, an Austrian refugee who joined the RAF, is on leave in London. I was almost killed in front of my own front door. I'd had lunch with my father and was standing in front of our flats. There was a huge crash, and 1,500 feet above us, I saw an explosion cloud. Splinters fell all around. I can still remember picking them up. It was a V2 that had blown up prematurely. The V weapons kill nearly 9,000 people in Britain they have no effect on the outcome of the war. Summer 1944, the Red Army advances onto German soil. In the autumn of 1944, the Allies cross the German borders in the west. Germany is caught in a colossal pincer movement. Meanwhile, Harris's campaign against the cities is again at full pitch. We all had a great respect for him, even though we called him Butch, short for Butcher. We didn't call him Bomber Harris, but Butcher Harris. Why? Well, he butchered the German. Bomber Command's list of targets damaged or destroyed. One big city is missing. Dresden. An airfield in the Midlands. The 13th of February, 1945. 800 British bombers are ready for takeoff. Stalin has asked for help from Allied bombers as his troops face desperate German resistance. Dresden is a distant target and has never been a military priority. Now Churchill has a chance to help Stalin and to show him Allied air power for the future. Dresden has few bunkers. Most of the flak has been removed to defend against Russian tanks. The city's full of refugees fleeing the Soviet advance. Der 13. Februar, es war Fasnacht. 
The 13th of February was in the middle of carnival, and we children were running around with paper streamers round our necks. I was nine. I can't remember what the grown-ups were doing. They weren't very bothered about carnival. But I remember we went to bed as normal, and at about 10 o'clock, the first siren sounded. In the night of the 13th of February, two waves of bombers lay waste to the center of Dresden. We were lying on the ground in the cellar, and then it was quiet, and we thought, we've survived. And then the warden came and said, women and children must leave the cellars. You've got to go down to the River Elbe. Thousands walk towards the grassy banks of the Elbe to avoid the death trap of the burning cellars. The second wave of bombers catches them in the open. And auf einmal, also das war. And suddenly, there was an explosion. And I thought I was flying through the air. We had no idea what had happened. I found myself lying under a block of stone. And he, the elderly man who'd been sitting with me, was now lying beside me on the ground. And he dragged it off me. I couldn't breathe. Actually, I couldn't even move. My mother was carrying the baby basket with the twins in it. And we were standing next to the cellar steps when suddenly a mass of people charged towards us from the other side. There was a terrible panic. The wounded were screaming and everyone just wanted to get out and we were literally lifted off our feet. I know my mother tried to hold on to the basket, but it was ripped out of her hands. People were climbing over each other, punching each other to get out of the burning cellar. But the two streams of people couldn't get out at the same time. The twins are never found. They burn to death in the cellar. In Dresden, as in Hamburg, Innumerable fires join up in one vast firestorm that sucks everything into it. The streets were on fire, people running in every direction. It was a terrible firestorm. Wind, a storm coming in from the side streets and rising. And there were whirlwinds at the crossroads. I saw people sucked into the flames. The wind was indescribable. It was a real storm. As his Lancaster turns for home, rear gunner Peter Twin has a grandstand view of Dresden in flames. Once we'd left the target and uh, on our way home, I could see the target for 100 miles. Just a dark red patch in the sky. I mean, we were, what, 23,000 feet, and uh, all you could see was a, just a red glow, even 100 miles away. The next day, the Americans arrived to finish the job. People burned by phosphor, no bigger than babies, twisted in their death agony. Whole families embracing, burned or suffocated or crushed. Limbs, bits of bodies hung in the trees on Dürer Square. Terrible sights. Many thousands flee the town. A woman was running in front of us with a suitcase and a handbag, and a wall fell on her. 
And then all you could see was the suitcase and the handbag. And the smell. It was bestial. They unloaded the bodies from trucks at the old market and burned them there. It takes three weeks to burn the 7,000 bodies on the old market. The death toll in Dresden is 35,000, at a time when the outcome of the war is no longer in doubt. The thought of that the bomb would hit an apartment house and perhaps kill a 25-year-old woman and her baby never entered my mind, not for a second. It isn't that it entered my mind and I rejected it, no. It never entered my mind at all. It just didn't. Oh, no, no. No, we had no moral doubts at all because, um, A, we didn't start it, and um, B, we were defending our own country. Um, so that was our position. Um, so we were quite happy uh, doing what we did because we wanted to get it over and done with and get back to normality. Public opinion in Britain and America begins to question the severity of the raids. In January 1945, Churchill had called for more strikes against cities like Dresden. Now he distances himself from Harris's strategy. It seems to me that the moment has come that the bombing of German cities simply for the sake of increasing the terror, though under other pretexts, should be reviewed. The destruction of Dresden remains a serious query against the conduct of Allied bombing. Harris feels deeply betrayed. He writes to Portal, the head of the Air Force. I do not personally regard the whole of the remaining cities of Germany as worth the bones of one British grenadier. Yet 50,000 of his men have already given their lives for his strategic bombing campaign. In the meantime, the heavy raids have continued. Bombs have reached every corner of the rapidly shrinking Reich. In the final weeks of the war, more cities are destroyed with horrendous casualties. When the campaign is called off in April 1945, 600,000 Germans have been killed. Seven million are homeless. On the Allied side, the raids have cost the lives of 85,000 airmen. May 1945. Goering is captured by the Americans. His last chance to pose in his fantasy uniform as the pilot prince. His plan to bomb Europe into slavery, a distant memory. He commits suicide on the 15th of October 1946, hours before his execution. For Harris, the war's end means exhaustion and disappointment. His bombers were supposed to win the war. His bomber command is the only unit left without a campaign medal. And Harris, the only senior general not granted a peerage. 
It seems Britain wants to forget the strategic bombing campaign. Harris retires with his wife to Africa. The bombers did not win the war alone. They wore down Hitler's air force and helped to immobilize his army. They made it possible for troops on the ground to finish the job. But in Britain as well as Germany, people got used to living under the bombs. Terror from the air never achieved its final objective, to crush a nation's will to fight. German raids on Britain kill 1,400. Londoners get a sharp taste of the future of warfare. There are reports of panic in the streets. The island fortress has been breached. Meanwhile, Britain's experts have already been busy. In Oxford, engineer and government advisor Frederick William Lanchester takes to his slide rule. In 1916, he works out how to destroy a whole city with bombs. He invents, theoretically, the firestorm. The critical point is that at which the pre-extinguishing appliances of the community are beaten or overcome. Beyond that point, the damage is disproportionately great. The city may be destroyed in toto. Not everyone believes that destroying cities is the answer. Munitions Minister Winston Churchill insists that terror bombing can't defeat a great industrial power. Nevertheless, by mid-1918, the RAF has built its own fleet of heavy bombers. 700 are killed in raids on German cities. On the 9th of November, 1918, brand new giant bombers are due to bomb Berlin. But the raid is postponed. Two days later, Germany signs the armistice. Berlin is spared. The Versailles Treaty forces the Germans to destroy their entire air force. 15,000 planes are handed over or ripped apart. But the Royal Air Force remains, and it needs a role. The new war minister, Winston Churchill, helps find one. Air policing. Britain has taken over large chunks of the defeated Turkish Empire. One of the men sent to control tribal uprisings is squadron leader Arthur Harris. Harris realizes that in the deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan, planes can do in hours what it would take troops weeks to do. Within 45 minutes, a full-sized village can be practically wiped out and a third of its inhabitants killed or injured by four or five machines. Harris's men become some of the top bombing pilots of the RAF. As early as 1908, writer H.G. Wells had imagined a bombing attack by the Germans on New York. By the time it is filmed in the 1930s, people are ready to believe in a full-scale bomb attack on their cities.
1935. In Germany, the new National Socialist government tears up the Versailles Treaty. World War I fighter ace Hermann Goering, now Hitler's closest confidant, is given the task of building up an air force at top speed. Hitler wants as many planes as possible, as fast as possible. In 1935, Goering officially announces the existence of his Luftwaffe. But the Luftwaffe is designed for a war of conquest. It's just a matter of time. Alarmed by Germany's new Luftwaffe, the British build up a bomber force of their own. Goering's Air Force is designed to help the German army grab territory. The new British bombers have a different aim. Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin in 1932. The bomber will always get through. My job to photograph them in advance. Propaganda films show the Germans making every effort to plan an accurate attack using the latest technology. For Genica, the reality is very different. On the 26th of April, 1937, the bombers of the Condor Legion are armed for the mission. 31 tons of high explosives and incendiaries. But the planes have very primitive bomb sites. Vittoriano Uruburu is watching from his home in the hills above the town. <laughs> There was a fat aeroplane with a pipe sticking out of it. We couldn't take our eyes off it. We'd never seen anything like it. And then suddenly it dropped its bombs and there was an enormous noise and rubble was thrown everywhere. And then I thought of my mother. Where is she? And I ran down to Guernica to find her. Smoke from the first explosions covers the town. The second wave dropped their bombs indiscriminately over Guernica. When I reached the town, women and children came running towards me, shouting, Help! Help! The policemen were gathering them together and pushing them towards the cellars. Then I saw my mother in the middle of the crowd. I yelled to her, Mother, don't go down into the cellars, you'll be crushed. I grabbed hold of her and we ran up the hill together to our home. And that's how we escaped the inferno. After three hours of bombing, more than three quarters of the town is destroyed. 1,600 civilians are dead or wounded. The bombers of World War II were a revolution in warfare, hitting the enemy deep behind the lines. Both politicians and generals were fascinated by the new weapon. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Bombing brought about the first total war in history. Everyone was involved, everyone a target.
No one anywhere is safe from the bombs. But can bombing really win the war? Guernica, in the Spanish Basque country. Inspiration for Picasso's most famous painting. The symbol of the total destruction by bombing of a peaceful town. For Guernica is a target for the most modern bomber fleet of the 1930s. The new German Luftwaffe. Adolf Hitler has sent his bombers to help Franco's fascists in the Spanish Civil War. The Condor Legion arrives in summer 1936. Reconnaissance photographer Alphonse Kersinger is given a special mission. I just know there was a road bridge north of Guernica, over the river Duerco, I think, and a railway bridge, and they had to be destroyed. And it was the bridge is still standing. Two days later, Alphonse Kersinger takes his camera to Guernica to record the first destruction of a town by aerial bombing. Faced with such devastation, Basque resistance in the town crumbled. Whether it was intended or not, the destruction of Guernica showed that a strategy of terror bombing can work. When word of the results reaches Luftwaffe headquarters in Berlin, the mission is judged a complete success. The first bomb had been dropped from the air more than 25 years earlier. The story started in 1911 in Italy's colonial war in Libya. Lieutenant Giulio Gavotti dropped four two-kilogram bombs by hand onto Turkish troops. The bombs, it was said, decisively weakened the enemy's fighting spirit. Three years later, at the start of World War I, bombs are still being dropped by hand. They're used for the first time in large numbers at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. Soon, special bomb racks are attached beneath the wings. The first bombers have arrived. The fighter pilots are the Knights of the Air. Hermann Goering is one of the leading aces in Red Baron Manfred von Richthofen's flying circus. For these flyers, the dogfight, man against man, is the ideal form of air war. But the Germans have other plans, to devastate the enemy's cities and destroy the morale of the population. In June 1917, they launch bombers against London. Giant aircraft, the Gotas, are built especially for the purpose. 